Well, hi, everybody. It's Kathleen from A Great Good Place for Books, and I'm super excited tonight um, to welcome you to uh, one of my favorite books of the season, which is uh, Songs in Ursa Major by Emma Brody. And this is Emma's debut novel, and she has worked in publishing for years. And um, I can tell you that this book is unputdownable, which is one of my favorite things to say about a book. And we are also really lucky to have Donnie Walton. And Sam, do you want to introduce Donnie? Um, well, Donnie, just in case somehow you missed it, is the incredible author of um, the final revival of Opal and Nev. And um, I will make a little announcement here just to let you know that we're going to be doing um, Opal and Nev for our book club on August 31st. So we encourage you to um, buy your copies now and start reading to join us for that. Um, and uh, Donnie, just thank you so much for joining. And we have another little announcement about Donnie's book, but maybe we'll save that for later in the conversation. Um, so Donnie, thank you for joining us. And um, maybe we could start a little bit with how the two, you know, sort of the connection with the two of you, because Emma did share um, a wonderful uh, sort of just a, a wonderful piece about how, you know, how you guys have a connection, so. Um. Oh, well, thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you, Sam. Congratulations, Emma, on this gorgeous, gorgeous debut book. I feel like we're sisters out here, both <laughs> got music novels out, both debut authors. What has it been like for you? Tell me all the things. Oh my God. I, what a trip, first of all, like seeing right? out, having people talk about these like made up performers that like, I'm sure you've experienced all the things. Um, I mean, it's just such an honor. And like the best part is getting to talk to writers I admire like you. So this is like, I mean, it's, it's just been such a beautiful experience and like watching so many authors over the past 10 years, like publish their books. I thought I would know what it was like and I just didn't at all. Like nothing can prepare you for it. So such an honor, like every single person who reads it, I still kind of can't believe that they've actually read it. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's just been a blast, like nerve wracking. Okay. Right. Blast. <laughs> yeah, like running from Zoom event to Zoom event and praying the Wi-Fi doesn't knock out. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Oh my God, I have a yeah. light taped to the back of my computer right now, which I know I need to do because it falls off otherwise. Like these are the things you only learn on a Zoom yeah. tour. Um, yeah, wow. it's Great. so many, so many things. It's definitely different than being on the road as a musician in the 70s, but like, I probably wouldn't have been awake for that anyway. So <laughs> there you go. Well, when I heard that um, you wanted to have this conversation, I was so excited because I had a similar conversation with Taylor Jenkins Reid, you know, like all our books are kind of in this conversation, like you said, about um, kind of rock music heroines um and so like i'm so excited that we're all kind of touching base um so this is a book that um it's it's in part you know a romance between the characters jane and jesse but really for me it's a romance between jane and music and i really want to start off by talking about your personal relationship with music and how it led to the spark for this novel what a great question. So, and I love that that's your like relationship to the book because that's definitely how I feel about it as well. Um, so I grew up with music in my house. My mom is an opera singer. So I've had a lot of exposure and I kind of compare it to growing up in a family where your parents speak another language that you can understand, but you don't necessarily speak it yourself. Like I've always had the freedom to dabble and I have a certain amount of proficiency with like technical terms just because I absorbed a lot from her. Um, and I, you know, I messed around a little bit in youth orchestra when I was younger and then I did college a cappella. So that was really the experience that gave me like firsthand knowledge of band dynamics. Cause when you're in an a cappella group you are basically in four bands at once <laughs> and it's a lot of drama. 
Um, but it's really fun and really rewarding. And that's like, you do everything you would do in a garage band. You sleep on floors, you tour, you have like relationships with other bands, you have relationships with each other. So I had, I had that sort of, I guess, percolating for about 10 years. Cause I, I graduated and I haven't really done music since. And then when I started thinking about this book, um, it was originally going to be a funeral plot. Like, this is where I leave you. Like I knew I wanted to do a book about these women, like these Quinn women. I knew I wanted it to have a folk music element, but I thought it was going to be a dead parent. And then I started researching these, you know, folk era icons, Joni Mitchell, Linda Rodstadt, Carly Simon, Carol King, um, which are like my parents' music. I grew up with them. And the more I read about these women and the kinds of challenges they encountered, the more I was like, these women are more interesting than the millennial girl that I've been thinking about. So we're just going to dial it back 50 years and start the story there. And that was sort of how it all kind of came together in that time period. Um, and then, I don't know, like specifically for me, like I didn't know that James Taylor and Joni Mitchell had dated. So when I was researching Joni, I mean, who knows that? It's it's like this open secret. Everyone, every, like they talk about it, but it just doesn't penetrate our consciousness. And for whatever reason, I think it's just, we all have these really disparate images of them. Like she's this like ever evolving icon. He's like the PBS guy with the stories. And when I found out that he'd written, you can close your eyes about Joni, it just totally blew my mind. Cause there are hours of footage of JT singing that song with everyone from Carly to Carol to Stephen Colbert. Wow. Like it's such a workhorse for him. So those were like all the different factors that kind of sparked Ursa and like, you know, put it together. Like we got the clay, we've got this life spark. And then suddenly we have a little like story that's alive. Um, but yeah, that's my funny. personal relationship, I think it's like both a mix of, of just being around music and then also like, I don't know, the music that I listened to, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You mentioned so many iconic women, not just Joni, but Linda Ronstadt and um, Carly Simon. And I thought so many of the women in, in the book were just fascinating. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm scrolling down for their names. Um, oh, Loretta Mays and, and Lacey. I was curious about Lacey. And if um, were any real life figures inspirations for those other characters? Because you have such a large supporting cast and they are all amazing. And I also want to ask about Hannibal Fame. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> is, is there there an Love it. Oh my God. Yes. So Loretta is basically a, like a semi version of Carol King like in the story she represents like someone who really like plays by the corporate rules and has like she follows a similar career path to Carol where she was like a studio writer in house and then she becomes a touring musician and then ultimately becomes a performer on her own and does her own solo album like the year after Jane's band has their album um, and so she's most closely related to Carol King and then Morgan is most closely related to Carly. Um, so they have sort of a similar background. Like the, there's like a chapter from Morgan's perspective later in the book. And I think like psychologically, she's very close to Carly in that. And then Lacey, Lacey is like, I gave her Etta James's kind of physique. Like she's got this like amazing blonde hair and she's just like this luminous presence. Um, and then I also thought about Odetta a lot when I was writing her. So it's, she also has like a little bit of Mama Cass in her because like Lacey's character is like this woman who, you know, started out on the folk circuit. She's like the only black woman there. And she mm -hmm. and Jane's mom are both sort of outsiders and they develop this like wonderful relationship where like Lacey's the star and Jane's mom, Charlotte is behind the scenes kind of supporting her and writing music for her. And then Lacey, get, her career takes off and she is in like a gilded cage essentially where she has a show, she has it sort of made, but like she has to stick within these very strict parameters mm -hmm. and ultimately like, she has all these questions, I think, that are like, 
about being true to yourself. Cause sometimes being true to yourself is saying no to your friends. And that's essentially what Lacey's story is. But she and Jane have kind of a special relationship. Like I have a lot of aunt type figures in the book and she's definitely like an aunt to Jane in certain ways. Cause she's the only one who really knows Jane's mother as a performer and is the only one who can like give her that history like one-on-one. So yeah. I love that character. Yeah. And Hannibal Fang, please <laughs> tell, for the, for the audience who hasn't met him yet, please let's talk about Hannibal, who he is. He's such a colorful, big personality. I, I'm so glad you brought him up. I really love him too. So Hannibal is kind of like a Mick Jagger, although he's a bass player, which my brother-in-law just reminded me was not Mick Jagger. I was like, I know, but he needs to align with Kyle, who's one of Jane's bandmates, who's a bass player and really loves him. So Hannibal's kind of a Captain Happen who shows up at at like various parties and just wreaks havoc. And he's like a bit of a Peter Pan. Um, He is, you know, part of a British invasion band Fair Play. And he just takes a shining to Jane. And he's really out there, like larger than life personality. But he like, he's kind of a sweetie. And every time he sees Jane, he's always like teasing her that they should get together. But he kind of looks out for her at these various functions where like, he's got it made, he's established. And Jane is always sort of skirting the sidelines and like a little bit out of vogue because that's just kind of her thing. Um, And he always has a way of dragging her back into the action. So he's, he's kind of like a little fairy godfather that's like giving her drugs and making her like the center of attention. (laughs) Amazing. So backtracking a little bit, um, you grew up sort of surrounded by music and having some technical understanding of it, which really makes those parts of the book so vivid and real. Um, I want to talk because I'm a geek. I want to talk a little bit about you said you were reading so much about the era of the 1970s and the things that women were facing. Can you talk more about that research process and what exactly it was that you were reading? Sure. Um, I read a few different books. So I read Reckless Daughter by David Yaffe, which is like this amazing contemporary, like Joni, it's like a deep dive into Joni's life. And he had basically like unfettered access to her. So he has these incredible interviews and he also does a really nice job of like summarizing and making eloquent some of the more like rambling, like later life interviews and he does a good job of recapping like sounds he's like an incredible musician like himself and also just like this amazing music journalist anyway I got a lot from his book um there are two chapters on blue which is the inspiration for Ursa Major songs Ursa Major Jane's confessional album so that was a big one um I read Carly Simon's autobiography and then I watched a few documentaries like Echoes of the Canyon, Linda Rodstadt's got a great documentary. And the rest was like weird stuff I found on YouTube, original Rolling Stones articles. Like there's a big journalistic component. I'm so interested in your thoughts on this because obviously like one of your protagonists is a journalist, you're a former journalist. Like I loved the idea of the press as like, I mean, okay. So I work in book publishing, which is, a strange as we we're all part of this business like it's a strangely anachronistic business where we still depend on like newspaper reviews and and written press whereas like pretty much everything else has become video (laughs) or television based and we see this even affecting book sales with like these crazy sales for the book club books like all this so I've when I was reading about the music industry I was like this is actually really similar to the way book publishing is now like music went through MTV and evolved but book publishing is weirdly like mutually intelligible with old recording and I work in acquisitions so there was a lot that I was able to kind of suss out intuitively and then go back and and look up things like you mentioned in your book like the 360 contracts like it was the kind of thing where I was like I know there's some kind of creepy contract and I was able to like retroactively go back and look that up so a lot of the research for Ursa was done sort of after the fact where I have a tiny journalism background. Like I worked at a, at a local independent weekly in Baltimore when I was in school. Oh, and so I know, I I know. Weekly, <laughs> so cool. it was amazing. It was like in this brownstone and everyone who worked there was a character. And 
I, I learned enough to learn how to fact check myself. So basically the first draft of Versa was like pie in the sky. And then I literally went through with a highlighter and was like, anything that seemed suspicious. I was like, you have to look this up. So there were hours of research that were like, how long did a transatlantic flight take? What time did the channel switch off? Like the sort of like lifestyle things. And then sort of immersing myself in the journalism of the music journalism of the day, like reading articles about these women when they broke out, like they're all like semi-sexist and just like, but trying really hard to understand and yet also not. So it was, it was fascinating. And the internet is an amazing tool. I was just, Emma, I was just going to say, how did people write fiction like this before the internet? I don't know because I spent so much time in YouTube rabbit holes, on Times Machine, in the Rolling Stone archives. Like it was all right there in my fingertips, looking at photography, like all those things were so informative for me. It's so nice. It makes it like this is I don't know if you ever had anything like this when you were working on Opal and Nev but like part of when I was getting into Jane and Jane's world was to kind of figuring out like just how things function by like walking a mile in her shoes and initially in the first draft of the book I had this like sequence that was only interesting to me that I actually like knew to cut before I sent it to anyone else because I was like this is bad, but it was all about Jane trying to figure out how to read her record contract. Cause I was like, how would a girl who has no education and no resources even begin to understand like what a royalty is? And I went through like this whole exercise on my fictional island, Baleen Island, where I was like, well, she'd know to like talk to maybe a real estate agent because that person handles contracts and like maybe they'd send her to the library, but it's like Jane's like in there and like, what year was the microfiche invented? It's like, (laughs) you can just start to like, like figure out these weird like anachronistic bubbles within your own understanding of the world. And like, I definitely came out of this with a greater appreciation for like the timeline of various technologies. And then also just like, certain movements that I never like I knew the Vietnam War went on for a really long time before I wrote this book but I have a completely different appreciation for it now (laughs) so and it's good to like know all that stuff as the writer even if it doesn't end up in the book it's just good to have it sort of like simmering in the back of your mind yeah totally did you have particular things that you were looking at when you were researching your book Oh my gosh, so much. I mean, um, I was looking at the politics of New York City in like 1971. And it's so interesting. I don't know if you've seen the the documentary Summer of Soul, but there's so many like overlaps. And there's this segment about the New York City mayor, John Lindsay and his relationship with Harlem. And I ended up like researching that for the book for like a tiny little footnote. (laughs) Like it only made that tiny little part, but still, like, I was so happy to, like, see that and be like, oh, yeah, you know, put a little bit of real life into that. Um, Those moments are are very satisfying. And the 1970s, you know, I'm sure you found that it's such a rich time to be writing about music because there was so much different kinds of music going on at the time. Yeah, totally. Like, the Laurel Canyon people like I was focusing on JT and Joni and they were like fairly apolitical for the time which is fascinating and like all the coverage I read like there's this amazing time article that came out in March of 1970 like right around when JT released Mudside Slim in the Blue Horizon which talks about how like basically protest songs had screamed themselves out and then the result was James Taylor, essentially, like this mellow, like soulful, sad boy rock. Oh, okay. And it, it was just really fascinating to put him in that context because it's sort of like, oh, yeah, you're right. Like he doesn't really talk about any of this in his songs. It's like a total escape. And even Joni, like California has kind of like a flip reference to the war and how long it's going on. But like 
she rarely got into it. And it's, it's fascinating just to see, like, I mean, I think on a certain level, that's just privilege, right? Like, like they didn't necessarily have to get into it. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, like, I also think the fact that they were so popular, people needed a little bit of a break after this war had been going on for so long. So it's always interesting to me to see like what catches fire at a given moment and like what like is, called up it's it's and that's just one as you say like that's just one area of music at that time like obviously there were other things happening like punk and all this other stuff so it's fascinating the world that you built is so immersive that like I did not even like think about the fact that they weren't making like political music or there wasn't talk about the war and all of those things was it um was it a concern for you when you were writing as to whether you should put that stuff in there or not? Or did this, at a certain point, did you just think this is not that world and I'm just going to stick to, to this world? I did think about it. So I've have other drafts and actually like I, I got to work on the screenplay a bit. So it's some certain things like made it into the film that are not going to be, that are not in the book, but like rich, in my head has a brother that's away but that didn't make it into the book because I had other things that needed to happen for Rich and he's he's not unfortunately but he's a side character so this is one of the things that's so hard is like you could write like a 900 page book or you could write like a character a a situation where you have like your main characters and they get dimension and then your side characters and you give them as much dimension as you can afford but at a certain point you're like all right well this is his big drama and I have to like, sort of, I don't want to give short shrift to this really important thing. So you end up kind of avoiding it. And I don't know if you had to make decisions like that. Like, obviously your book is like, go ahead. Wait, what were you about to say? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the character of um, Bo Bond, um, there, I had a whole other story, which I won't reveal here, but he had a whole other thing and I was considering including it and I just decided it didn't belong in this book, you know. Maybe um, we'll do another book. Oh, uh, who well, knows? I, I was gonna ask you, cause <laughs> I think the the women, I haven't read Opal and Nev yet and I'm I, it's on my, on my bedside table, but the women of the family could be their own book, right? Oh, totally. Um, so that I, and, and I could, I could imagine that like they're all your characters, Emma, are so fully realized that they really could carry their own stories. And I, I just wonder if sometimes if that's painful as a writer, <laughs> where you're like, you don't, you feel bad. I don't know. I mean, it sounds silly to say it, but. It's not um, silly. It's not silly at all. I mean, I like live for my third, my third tier and second tier characters because like Jane and Jesse, I like, I don't want to sell the book short. They're great. But when you're the writer, you're, you're going through it like tens and twenties and thirties and forties and however I don't I don't think it was hundreds but it feels like I've been to this book hundreds of times so like your main characters who are like your fulcrum points they're exhausting (laughs) and then it's like your your second and third tier characters become sort of a refuge for you creatively as you're going through so wanting to develop them I think is totally natural and I feel like there are certain moments in my narrative and I'd also be like really interested to hear this from you Donnie because you're so gifted at having these like very convincingly different voices but for me there was like a reprieve in getting to swap in a different narrator at certain at some points and also wanting to give the reader distance from like high full chrome drama just to get their breath because you don't want to like blast through everything right away you want to like let people calm a little bit so that they can like then get even more amped up um and so getting to like invest in characters like Alex who's only got two chapters and like Simon I love he's only got two chapters as well but those are ways of like pumping up Jane and like honestly in the eyes of a man um and also like giving the reader a little distance from like Jane and Jesse's whole thing um they're like both useful tricks and like little presents you give yourself when you're like okay I can take a break I can edit this chapter about Alex right now (laughs) well I have to say my favorite was the woman from um snitch magazine I love that bad. chapter. Yes, I loved her. And I thought it was so fresh 
to kind of give like little quick hit point of view changes because when I was writing you know Opal and Nev one of the reasons why I wanted so many voices is because I wanted to be able to see those two characters from the outside I wanted to like be able to see the different dimensions that you know Opal couldn't access and Nev and Nev couldn't access and Opal and so it was just a way to you know ironically to deepen the main characters while often like giving a little quick hit of fun to another another voice totally totally I mean Opal's relationship with her sister is so dynamic and I think that's like a similarity like in the sense of like having the women that are close to your main character like that's how you know like what a person's really like like when you see a woman in the context of the other women that she's the closest with like and I also just think that's a special thing about sisters like I think the person that most explains Jane is probably her mother but it's also Maggie in that relationship. And I feel like getting to see like Opal and Pearl together, it's like you immediately understand, like that's just something I love about your book. Um, You just immediately get this sense of Opal because you see her, like she's the shadow and then there's the light and it's so good. It's so good. Guys, read Donnie's book. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Oh, thanks. Um, We're gonna get to Jesse and Jane in a bit. And I have lots of questions about that, but, Another thing that I loved, like the relationship that was actually super tender for me was Jane and Willie. Can you talk about, um, and actually I was in a conversation earlier today about writing friendship and um, the question came up, had anybody ever seen, um, you know, literary fiction where there is a friendship portrayed just a straight platonic friendship between a man and a woman with like no will they, won't they, like kind of tension. And I just love the evolution of Jane's um, relationship with her manager um, and how it evolves over time and how they come to trust each other. Um, Did you always know that that relationship would end in that place? That is such a writer question because the answer is no, I did not. So the first version of the book, like, it actually reminds me a little bit of your book in in a certain sense, like Willie really disappointed me um, because he was, I don't know, like when I first wrote it out, I was like, he doesn't stand by Jane. He basically like kowtows to the man and like is too afraid. Like basically Willie and Jane are kind of foils for each other. Like Jane has this legacy of like vengeance against the record industry because they really screwed over her mother. And Willie comes from a family of record execs where each of his brothers all have their own label and his dad's this like big wig and Willie's the youngest one. And so he he's always having this relationship like with his brothers in his head. And he's like wondering like, am I going to stand out or am I just going to be part of the pack? Sorry. That's Freddie Mercury. That's my dog. He's, he's oh. hearing a motorcycle outside. Um, really what I didn't know, like people are out this late at night. This is like so fresh for me. Okay. So long story short, um, in the first version I wrote of the book, Willie basically like he has the opportunity to stand with Jane um, and be help her be true to herself and he totally fails and is a coward and backs down and Mm -hmm. I wrote that and I was like I kind of knew it was coming the whole time and I was like all right well this is true to life and then I put it away for about eight weeks and started like really intense revisions and by the time I got to the end of it I won't spoil it but basically like their relationship does completely evolve Willie became much more lifelike in his struggle um about his place and he he comes through and it's honestly for me like you're touching on it well like it's a platonic romance but they have like Jane and Willie have like the happy ending in the book and it's yeah. like it's it's really earned because you know they have dark moments and and both of them have to grow but like they do a good job of taking responsibility to each other which I just really like to see and also like I don't know, like Willie can't, Willie knows there are certain things he can never do, but like through Jane, he's able to be different. And Mm -hmm. it was cool to see that kind of come to life. Um, Cause I did not know that was going to happen. And it was surprising in a nice way. So that's something that you picked up on that. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Willie felt kind of like a David Geffen type of character to me. Totally. Um, 
like he he definitely has some of those characteristics like I don't I don't David Geffen like seems like he I don't know him but from what I've read it seems like he had he didn't like himself very much and I think Willie does like himself um Mm -hmm. but that was also like an evolution and he's struggling with it yeah so just a reminder, uh, everyone watching, please go ahead and put, you know, put your questions um, in the comments, in the chat, and um, we'll get to them at the end. Okay, Jesse and Jane, so much heat. <laughs> I was not, okay, the sex scenes, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> and as a writer, I'm always like, I chicken out. Like I am always very intimidated by writing about sex. And it's such an important part of, of course, life and love and relationships. Can you talk about the process of writing those scenes? And if there's any writers watching, what tips you have for writing good sex scenes? Well, first of all, this is a very validating question for me because a certain reviewer from the Boston Globe thought my sex scenes were not good. And I just have to say on the record that no women have complained about them. So <laughs> I'm still a little sore. And so I feel a little like impostery giving advice on the subject since apparently I'm like not a proven commodity, but I'll take Donnie Walton's word over that guy. So, I mean, there is like, there is, the wisdom about sex scenes is like, if you like it, like it's probably working. Um, and I think for me, like Jane and Jesse are musical creatures. And so the idea of their bodies being instruments is something that's like a part of the story, both when they're like very physically active and healthy and, and when they're not, and when they're suffering. So that was something that I think when I was thinking about their love making, I was like, how would they play each other? Like, how would these two musicians like tune into their bodies? And I think having sort of that framework gave me enough distance from it for myself as Emma to have the courage to then go in and like really do the nitty gritty. I also have like certain preferences, like there are certain words I don't like, like I don't like the word mouth. So okay. if I, it's rare for me to use the word mouth, like I don't like it. So there's the certain, or... yeah, it's like, it's more like crude, like I'm okay with lips, oh. but like something about mouth, I don't know. It's just, so there are definitely like Emma preferences in the syntax, but like thinking about like, I don't know, there's also, I think they're both really young and able-bodied. That's the other piece of this. So like, they don't have like malfunctions. They don't have embarrassment. Like writing Jane and Jesse's sex was like such an escape from real life. So I think it, it depends what you're going for. And I gave myself license to write sort of like, not like fantasy sex scenes, but like it, it is complicated and not all their sex is the same. But I think being able to like prop myself up and like create that distance by giving myself like orders helped me have the courage to like put it out there. And for the record, it's very awkward when people I know bring it up. And both of my parents have been very supportive. I have like 11 uncles and like, I just don't want to know. Like, so there's a certain amount of like mental distance <laughs> that just you just have to dive in that's all I have to say just dive in I love but, it and I love that like whenever Jane and Jesse are together through the ups and downs of their relationship I was always like oh there's a chance that they might have sex now and it added like such a tension like it you know like it was like the scenes were so suspenseful because it was like oh <laughs> what's gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked about the rock and roll we've talked about the sex let's talk about the drugs right okay. um these are sort of the tropes of the the rock and roll story um and it's really hard to write about this era in popular music um without talking about drugs um and yet you kind of also as a writer you want to avoid some of the tropes that you've seen over and over again what was your approach to that? What, what was it that you wanted to avoid and what did you decide to lean into when it came to that aspect of addiction? So this is a story that has a lot about codependency in it. And that part of it is very serious for me. And I'm very interested in 
the way that people suffer in those relationships. The actual mechanics of drug use in rock and roll were something that I had no idea about. Like I knew because I've watched movies, but I am a very tame person. Like seriously, I've repeated this several times, but I've like never been up past 10. So those aspects of it were like pure fiction. And I just researched and talked to cooler friends and like family members and was like like there's this line that Hannibal Fang is like if your throat starts to burn like my brother told me to say that so um like the mechanics of that were sort of like as you say like you're writing a story about rock and roll like I think part of strength what even if you're going for something like more literary or more original is to understand the tropes of your genre and you you have a commitment when you write one of these stories to your reader who's picking up your book and knows what to expect to cover that. So I did my best, to be honest. And I think if it rings true, it's because there are like factors that go with drug addiction um, and things like Jesse struggles. Like, I think I was able to get through those intense scenes by thinking about like situations that I've encountered. Um, like we've all been disillusioned and seen people do things they can't help but do and we've seen people hurt themselves. So I have very real experiences with that that I was able to draw on, but the mechanics of his addiction and his struggles, all research. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, um, I, I appreciate the the note about the codependency, and I, I have to say, like, w when that's revealed that that Jesse has that struggle, like, immediately I was like, oh, no, you know, you just knew that it was going to be so fraught and painful. Um, but and I think it was such a, a skillful, now it sort of feels symbolic, is that she literally, Jane literally starts as his caregiver, right? So that's just woven into how they get to know each other. And not that those things wouldn't have evolved anyway, but anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's true. I mean, it's, I think like part of what is explored in this project is that like we know the Morgan story, like we know the story of the girl that gets sucked in and it's awful. And that girl, I felt bad for her the whole time. Like it's, it's awful. Yeah. Um, but I wanted I to feel that I feel that empathy from you um, in writing about Morgan and writing in Morgan's point of view, which I thought was so beautiful. And I love that you did not villainize her at all, even though, you know, at some point she is Jane's, I guess, I guess, for lack of a better word, rival. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it was such a beautiful, empathetic portrait of her. Thank you. Yeah I, yeah, I mean, the real trick in this book is like, if you're looking forward to them having sex for the whole book, like, that's great. Because part of what it is, is like, there are lots of prejudices around drug addiction, around mental illness. And if Jesse is still attractive after you know that, then I've done a good job. And part of why he is, is because Jane never engages with him. Like, she has other reasons for it. Um, but she if she was there seeing him on a daily basis, like there's no way he would stay this mystical figure for us. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know what that would be like. Like I wanted to see it from the perspective of the girl who comes away. And part of the reason for the strong family is because I thought it would be fun. But part of the reason is because that kind of strength doesn't come from no from nowhere. So the yeah. idea like Jane, like Jane's Jane's poor, but her family is like her wealth. And that's juxtaposed with these other characters who have a lot of material wealth, but no support. So it's it's fascinating to see like where that all gets them. And it was it was just, I don't know, it was, it was wonderful to see these characters just like play it out. And honestly, I felt like I was like recording them, so. Wow. I would love to talk about um, your process for writing the song lyrics, because I thought they were all so beautiful and convincing. Um, and one of the things that really knocked me out about Daisy Jones and the Six was that she sprinkles lyrics throughout the book and then you hit the end and there's like this appendix with fully written songs, which I was like, wow. <laughs> so can you talk about like, did you also write full songs or how did you, how did you write the lyrics? How did you get the rhythms right? Um, all of that. Okay. Um, well, okay, so I also really liked that piece of Daisy, and I thought it was really fun, and I was like, okay, like, 
part because you're reading a book like this and it's like a book like yours as well where like you you hear the mention of every title and you're like I can't wait to know what that sounds like and part I like I was like how did she do it like how did she do it and I was like she really wrote the songs like you open the back and you're like that's how she did she really wrote the songs so yeah. I think I was emulating TJR to a certain extent by in terms of technique because I wanted to deliver a similar experience of like I mean, it's, it's a different story in the sense that like you're decoding an album, like you see the Jane's lived experiences and you see the food of her creativity. Like you literally see the things that she then makes metaphors out of. Um, but it's similar in that having, you want the music to seem really real. So I, I wanted to set out to do that. So I basically like wrote the, as I said, like wrote the first draft and then afterwards, part of like researching and, and going back and like giving it meat was like, I made an inventory of all the songs I was going to need because it's like 30 something because like Loretta has songs like basically like Jesse has a couple albums. Jane has a full band album and Ursa Major. So I wrote down like what I needed and everything in the book at that point was like lyric X, lyric Y. And it was really a fun experience, to be honest, because similar to the sex scenes, I was writing as Jane, like the Emma Brody songs are like, I hate double-sided parking. Like it's like <laughs> super fraught guys and super boring. So I really feel that though. But, but for Jane, like I just lived mm. this whole like three years of her life. So mm. I, I knew what I had to do based on like the story and it was a blast to go back so I wrote I wrote the lyrics and then my brother Ben who is like a total virtuoso like a lot of Jane's abilities like her ability to just pick up a stringed instrument and understand it and know it those are based on like what I've seen my brother do and so he was kind of available randomly and I was about to get married and I think he wanted to be close and so like at night he'd text me and be like, I want to write a sad song right now. And I had have these lyrics and I was like, he doesn't know this is Jesse, but sure. And so he actually ended up composing music for about 10 of them. And wow. it was cool to see them actually like work. Like I never thought they would. So that is amazing. So you actually have heard these songs. You're like the only two people <laughs> in the world, maybe who heard these songs. Maybe like maybe people. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, like some of them, I will say Ben didn't read the book. So some of them are the songs and then other ones are like, those could be the songs, but like not necessarily <laughs> like what I, what I think. Um, but like he did one for Ursa Major that I love. He did one for Wallflower that I love. Um, and, and those were cool. It was just great when it intersected. So it's, it was, and it was a pleasure to see. Cause also then when I went back and refined what I'd written about like Jane collaborating with Rich, cause at the beginning, Jane's not a lyricist. She's just a songwriter. So it, it informed everything like getting your hands dirty is like invaluable. <laughs> so love it. Love it. There was actually, <laughs> there was a line in your acknowledgements actually that like, I was like, ooh, I was very intrigued by it because I found it to be sort of a Joni Easter egg. And I was like, are there more throughout the book? So it's, let's have a round for the mental note, which is like, I, I even when I read the line, I heard it in Joni's voice. Um, are there other sort of fun moments that are sort of Easter eggy for you that maybe not everybody picks up on? Do you wanna give like maybe one example? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm so impressed by you and just gratified because it's like that's the one acknowledgement in the whole thing where I break the like and thank you to rhythm and you like totally picked up on it. And I did it because the line is like, let's have a round for these freaks and these soldiers and let's have a round yeah. for these friends of mine. And my my acapella group are certainly like freaks and soldiers. So it, like I'm gratified that you saw that. That makes me so happy. Um, you're the first one. So other, there are a couple more Joni lines. I actually like speaking of my brother, like mentioned that there were two. And then when he read the book, finally, he was like texting me like every like 50 pages being like, is it this one? And I was like, is oh, so this? I guess there are like eight. <laughs> um, so there are like actual Joni lyrics. And then there are two sequences that are like, totally inspired by blue one is there's a Christmas sequence that's like 
it's like so river and then oh, roger yeah. oh right 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 and i feel like yeah when we when we hear about one of jane's later albums near the end the title reminded me of court and spark yeah kind exactly glitter and grime yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i love that those were little bursts of joy for me thank you um so you have a background as an editor, um, which I think is so interesting. And um, I know, you know, my background as an editor in journalism, it helped me in some ways in the writing process and it hindered me in some ways in the writing process. And I'm curious what it was like for you as you were working on this book. I'm not sure how long it took you to write it, but um, you know, whether there were moments where you had your editor's hat on instead of like a writer's hat, that's my problem a lot of times. Um, but uh, I'm curious how that worked out for you. I want, I want your answer to that question too. So my answer is it was really hard to get the editor out of the room. And I wrote like 15,000 words first, like that process that evolution that we were talking about at the beginning where I was like it's a contemporary story oh no actually maybe it should happen in the past like that was all very encumbered by like hearing the thoughts of my like fiction editor colleagues like being like this is cute but it's small <laughs> like, and like knowing like how it would be perceived this and that and then finally I started writing the band just started writing themselves and that at that point I was like, this is good and fun. And it was fun enough that it was able to get me to like flip modes and play. Yeah. Um, oh, that's okay. The fun is the key, right? The fun, like when you, when you're having it, you just kind of almost go into a fugue state and, yes. you know, um, what were, what were the fun parts of writing this book? Whether it's a particular scene that you remember having a lot of fun writing? It's such a good question. So a lot of it became more fun when I went back. Like, like I was mentioning, like I'm an inexperienced introvert. So like, I don't remember, and, and I have experienced this fugue state you talk about. So like the LA party scenes, like I don't remember writing them for the first time. And then I came back and I was like, these are actually pretty good. And like went back and like had to judge them obviously for like drug use, um, things that I didn't know. But, uh, I think any scene where Jane's performing was pretty fun for me to write. Um, like there were certain things where I wanted a desired effect. Like there's a scene where Jane is at the Grammys and that took a lot of work to get that right. But like writing it the first time was fun, even if rereading it, it didn't sound anything like what I hoped. Um, so there are certain things that like when you're in that first draft mode where you're just finding out what happens, even if you haven't like executed it to the best of your ability, all of that is just fun to sort of see like, oh, and these things match up and this and this. Um, yeah. What about yeah. you? Um, I had a lot of fun writing the final scenes, like the final concert scene. Yeah, that was, I don't remember <laughs> writing big patches of that. I don't. And it's so weird how that happens. And you hit it on the head, you, it's moments that like, I look at the book now and I'm like, yeah, I don't remember writing that. That was a good <laughs> writing day. <laughs> you were channeling. It's so I love I was that. Channeling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are wow, running out of time. We actually have a question. Oh. Yeah. Um, could some of those songs be part of the screenplay that's coming out? And would you enjoy seeing your own songs out there in the world? And that's from the an anonymous attendee. Oh, mysterious. Um <laughs> I would love to see them. I mean, I like, listen, if this movie gets made, anything they want to do is fine by me. So if they want my songs, great. If they don't, great. Um, but it would be a dream to see them. That would be amazing. And if Sarah Jarose could write the music, then that would be also a dream. Like I'm very open to whatever would happen. But yeah, that would be really exciting. The songs are in the current draft of the screenplay because it was better with them but they could be swapped out at any moment, totally open to changes. So here we go. <laughs> Can you tell I've been through this process? <laughs> and and how, how is that process for you switching from 
being the author of a book to writing the adaptation? It was a huge learning curve, to be honest. Like I, I don't know what your experience with it is like, but it, like for me, it was like learning how to show everything I had told and telling everything I had shown. And the word play in screenplay is not a joke. Like I didn't realize like how many micro scenes I use. Like I'm constantly having Jane have like a conversation over like several locations, which is like a big no-no in screenwriting. And also like Jane's a very quiet character, which I didn't really realize until I tried to adapt her. But like she has a lot of thoughts, but she's not chatty. And so keeping her cool, but also making her more talkative. Like there were things like that, that like, I mean, it just took like months because it's yeah. really hard to do. So I had very patient producers who were willing to work with me and like hopefully get me up to snuff. But it was, it was a huge, huge learning experience. Um, it was really cool. It's exciting. Um, I do, I do want to remember that there was another piece um, for Donnie and I would love to sneak it in if we could before we me run too. out of time. Um, unless Kathleen, do you want to, do you want to let everyone know? No, you go, go Sam. Okay. So what, what we learned, um, when we all hopped on the call is that Opal and Nev has been nominated. Is that the correct term? It's, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's part of Jimmy Fallon's summer reading and everyone on this call, everyone on the planet can vote. And Mike, our wonderful tech host, man, man on, of the hour has posted in the chat. Um, a link and anyone can go on and vote. So we wanted to just um, just say congratulations oh, about that and thank encourage everybody thanks. to support uh, Donnie's amazing book. I appreciate that, thanks. Um, Emma, so have you, like I know this is kind of a touchy question, but have you and your producers batted around casting ideas? Um, Not that you have to say any names, but you know, are there people that you have in mind? I like, this is always a really embarrassing question for me because it reveals that I don't know any current stars. So like, I would be happy with like Anya Taylor Joy. She'd be amazing. But I'd also, I could see like Olivia Rodriguez playing Jane. Like I am so open. I kind of want an unknown for Jesse just because like there are so many like perfect hunky dudes out there that can play the guitar. And it's like, why not give one of them a chance? And I like the idea of the movie being like a reversal of the book where like the woman is grounding it and she's the known quantity. And then the man oh, yeah. is like the unknown yeah. quantity. Do you guys have ideas? Like I- Well, I haven't got to that to that point yet. Nothing to announce just yet. Um, but yeah, of course, you know, like you dream about it. Uh, and I think, you know, the the sort of interesting quirk of mine is that you know there would need to be like an older opal and a young opal and an older nev and a young nev you know so it's sort of like thinking about like those pairings um but i'm also intrigued by the idea of a, an unknown in a major role you know i think that would be really really cool I mean, I was thinking about, well, I was thinking about David Bowie for, a lot for Nev, but I was, and that's not obviously possible, <laughs> even as older Nev, unfortunately. But that's tight, yeah. yeah. But like Ed Sheeran is like, obviously like the redheaded British rocker right now, but also, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's fun it's to think about. And, and I'm sure that you have gotten lots of uh, recommendations on uh, social media, uh, I mean, yeah. listen, if this actually, if we find a director and this gets made, I'll take any recommendations I can. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like right now I'm like, yeah, sure. Whoever, like, well, whatever. Um, but well, there's, so, there's so many opportunities for, I can sort of imagine a whole ensemble cast for the older characters as well. Like some, some of the really good villains, you know, the producers and those, oh my God, you could get some great people just to pop in and you know, do those scenes. Be amazing. Mm -hmm. That'd be yeah. so great. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. I'm thinking about um, Vincent Ray. Like that could be, uh, you know, having sort of like a star as that villain. I love, look at your face. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent is the big bad of the book. He's terrible. Oh gosh. Me, but... <laughs> Well, Emma, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. And Donnie, 
we'll all be voting. And Sam, thanks for joining us. Oh, this was so fun, you guys. This was and, one of um, my favorite. If you haven't read this book, you guys need to. And you need to read Donnie's book too. Can you hold that up? Oh. I can hold Donnie's book. Oh. I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, we got it right there. And um, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And Donnie, thank you again. Number two, this has been wonderful. And Emma, it was everything I imagined it would be. So I'm so glad I stalked your publicist. <laughs> me too. <laughs> thank you so much for having both of us. Thank you for having me. This is amazing. Like, yay. Thank you so much. Okay. Congratulations, Emma. Right. Thank you so much, Johnny.